Hello, and welcome to the Six Figure Developer Podcast, the podcast where we talk about new and exciting technologies, professional development, clean code, career advancement, and more. I'm John Calloway. I'm Clayton Hunt. And I'm John Ash. With us today are Jeffrey Frederick and Douglas Squirrel. Jeffrey is an internationally recognized expert in software development and has over 25 years experience. Douglas has been coding for 40 years and has led software teams for 20 of them. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello there. Thanks for having us. Indeed. We sound, we sound so old. <laughs> <laughs> Experienced. Well, uh, Something so like that. Be, be, before we jump into the meat of things, would you maybe give our listeners an introduction to yourself, uh, perhaps tell them how you got started in the industry? Sure. I'll, I'll go first. I'm Jeffrey Frederick, and um, I got started uh, in uh, way back in 92 uh, in a, a small company called Borland. <clears throat> and this is like a dog whistle. People who are old enough go, oh, yeah, Borland. And people who are young, kids these days, they don't know their history. <laughs> they, they're like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, started at Borland. Um, to these days, I'm a managing director at a fintech company in London, uh, four days a week, and then one day a week I do executive coaching and executive facilitation. Great. And uh, my name is Squirrel. Uh, so you can either call me Douglas or Squirrel, but uh, I, like somebody else on this podcast, I, I go by my surname usually. And um, uh, I have been leading software teams for this long time, but not at companies you've heard of, even if you're old like Jeffrey. So uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I, I wouldn't have worked at any place that probably any of your listeners would have uh, heard of or experienced, but they've all been startups of one variety or another, kind of larger startups and smaller startups. That's been my background. And then uh, in the last six years after being CTO at a number of them and, and making a ton of mistakes and learning from them, I became a uh, uh, expert and a consultant on uh, making your technology team and in fact your whole startup more productive and effective and uh, doing that through the power of conversations. That actually if you wind up talking to your tech team, you'll have a lot more success than if you hide them in a corner. So uh, <laughs> that, that's what I've been doing for the last six years is uh, proving that over and over again at, at over 110 different organizations. I, I thought just pizza under the door works just as well as conversation. <laughs> it, it, surprisingly, the pizza doesn't communicate the user's <laughs> needs. It's strange. It just I doesn't come along with the pizza. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask how you decided to become an expert and, and how you arrived at conversations being the, the thing that helps teams. Oh, oh well, wow. that's a fantastic question yeah should, should i start I, I think i started well, it's, it's this, your fault Jeffrey. yeah so it, it has, to, say, it has to start with you because it's definitely your fault so so i got into a twitter argument as a as a young cto well not that young but young in experience and uh, i got into a twitter argument one of those useless twitter arguments that we're all very used to now but in the early <laughs> days of twitter it was kind of new and exciting and um uh, there was somebody who was commenting on the sidelines of this argument and he kept making these completely strange off the wall comments about how maybe it was my fault that my team wasn't effective and maybe it was that uh, uh, I could have different kinds of conversations with the people in them completely foreign it sounded really odd and whereas I'm having this what I thought was really productive argument um, we would now say arguing at the top of our ladders that was you know this kind of debate about uh, you're right I'm right um, uh, I'm right you're wrong uh, 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 over and over again and he said you know it would be helpful if, if, if you were transparent about what you were thinking I had no idea what he was talking about um, and I found it so intriguing that I went and found him and uh, he's this wonderful guy named uh, Benjamin, who um, uh, Benjamin Mitchell, who who had studied this old um, uh, social science technique, this old thing called action science uh, that had been started in the 70s. It was kind of as old as me, uh, but I'd never heard of it, didn't understand it. Um, but he kept saying all these weird and sort of wise but, but befuddling things. It was kind of like the Buddha. You know, you just hear this stuff and you'd say, wait, well, what? Well, how, how can that work? So I spent more time with him and um, started really studying these techniques. That st the, and the wonderful thing about action science is it got science in the name. So you can <laughs> go and try this stuff. You can actually go and see whether it works. You don't have to wonder, you know, it's like, does gravity work? Well, let's see. If I drop something, smashes on the floor. Okay, gravity, mm -hmm. probably true. Um, you know, clairvoyance, well, I try to predict what is going to happen. It, it doesn't happen. Probably not true. So you can test these things just the same way, all the things we'll talk about today. We encourage listeners to go and try it because you, we won't believe us. It'll be like me listening to Benjamin uh, saying, you know, you could actually change your whole organization if you just talked differently. Mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. doesn't seem right. 
and I got really excited about this. And then I started bringing other people in. I'd hired Jeffrey uh, uh, into my team. He eventually replaced me and did a much better job. Um, and uh, uh, I brought in other folks, and we started studying this stuff. And maybe Jeffrey you can take over from there because you've you've been carrying on that dojo tradition uh, since we started it. Yeah, right. That, so we, that was probably about uh, 2012 that Squirrel and I and Benjamin and an, an, uh, another friend of ours started this really intensive weekly uh, uh, meeting. Um, and, uh, and, and but then I, I enjoyed it so much and I wanted also more people to get the benefit of it. So I started um, bringing it in into the management team at the company I was at and really started disseminating it across uh, first the technology team, um, but then later it was picked up uh, and and took around the whole uh, the whole company. Everyone was trained in this, and it just had a dramatic turnaround. Um, and we, we measured could measure this as you say the science. It wasn't an intentional, but we were in a situation where from a survey we done internally, we found that the uh, interdepartmental um, scores for mutual trust and respect were very low. And um, I said, well, coincidentally, this communication stuff we're trying over here in technology, it predicts that you will improve your mutual trust and respect if you talk this different way. And so we, when we rolled it out, then a year later, those, those numbers were completely different. We made a massive change over the course of a year. And one of the things I'm really um, proud of there is that not only did we have that direct effect, but it, it's the kind of thing now that even it's been several years as, as people have left the company, uh, uh, many of them are in touch. We have this alumni group and the, a lot of people look, look back and talk about the culture at the company and, and this element of the communication is the one that people always say, I, I wish I could take this. I, I, want to, I want to take this into my new company. I want to take this mm. with me. Mm. So that's, uh, that's really what has made it um, so impactful for me is just having lived through that experience and seen it. Uh, and then as Squirrel mentioned, we, I do these um, public conversational dojos and have now for several years had people uh, show up uh, and um, start learning the techniques and then come back and talk about uh, the impact it's made for them in, in their lives, uh, either, either at home or in, in their careers. Indeed. And Jeffrey, you should tell those people to hire me, because what I did is I went out and took it to like all these different organizations, because listeners might be thinking, well, gosh, whatever this crazy thing is that, that they're talking about, it probably only works in that one case. Well, mm -hmm. um, Argyris, the guy who invented it way back in the 70s, tried it with tens of thousands of people around the world and found that it worked. And then I can tell you from having applied it in hun uh, literally hundreds of organizations uh, that, that um, it, it's uh, applicable and usable in a very wide variety of situations um, and uh, that it's tremendously transformative um, not only to people's attitudes and the culture and their their satisfaction but also to the bottom line uh, I, I typically say yeah. that if a startup hires me their their valuation goes up by at least a million pounds and that's not because I am just this fantastic person who knows exactly how they can apply kubernetes or, or use the right docker magic to, to uh, um, uh, deploy differently I'm the person who comes along and says you know it'd be really good if instead of slipping, slipping that pizza under the door, if you went and talked to them in this way, and if you got connected with your development team, uh, and, and if they were developing the software that you actually need, and developers, it would be really great if you had this conversation in this different way with your sales organization. And that is transformative. Um, and a lot of people uh, are surprised by it, but then when they see it, they see what tremendous benefits it has for them. Why do you suppose that that's such a novel idea? Is it just a, a leftover from the the way we used to develop software? It, um, you know, it, I know it's humans. With with looking at me, you wouldn't realize that I I too know what Borland is. Uh, <laughs> so I've I've got a, a few gray hairs myself. And and remember that we used to do software in this waterfall method, right? And and then we then agile became a thing, and everybody said, oh, agile is 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 the path forward. That means we don't write re requirements. Um, and, and the, the businesses called our bluff and, and said, okay, now we'll do this agile thing, go. Mm -hmm. But the problem is we didn't really change anything. That's why I said, when you first asked, I said, this is because we're humans. So what Jeffrey was seeing at Borland long ago and what you were seeing in, in your long ago experience and, and some of our the, the listeners are probably still observing is this this um, kind of uh, waterfall, very controlled, um, super predict, uh, they're an attempt to be predictable, which never works out, um, uh, that, that has these huge phases of, uh, of development. We just made those phases shorter, which is a great thing. But what we didn't do is create the trust, reduce the fear, help people to understand why they were doing what they were doing, create effective commitments and accountability. 
And we didn't know how to do that. It's not natural to humans to do that. It's much more natural for humans when they're under conditions of threat or embarrassment to act in a way that's defensive. Mm -hmm. And a way to be ineffective, but, but skillfully, is to uh, have this um, uh, approach, which you see both in the kind of Borland waterfall way and in the modern agile way of um, not really trusting your development team, not really uh, reducing your fear of your sales organization and what they might sell uh, that, that you can't deliver and not take action on that, but to put a process in place instead. Yeah. And that's what I see over and over again. I have to undo at uh, uh, organization after organization. It's a great business model for me, um, but <laughs> well, I'm trying as hard as I can to put myself out of business. Yeah, I think that's one of the uh, the big issues with Agile as it's presented. You know, if you, if you look back to the original concept, it was about communication, but businesses turned it into a process, and it, it doesn't really work as a as a process. The problem was that they didn't define what communication meant they just said we we value communication over these other things uh but they didn't say what communication was and the business interprets it uh communication as we need this button and we need it by friday which is effective communication well, it's very well, transparent you, 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 well it's actually it's very clear they want the button and they want it by friday the problem is there's a whole bunch of other stuff they're not saying mm -hmm. and that's the part they're not being transparent about and they're not being curious about what the development team might be able to tell them and the other way around because this yeah. this goes both ways and the the, the the what you touch on there clayton is is one of the things that really drove us to write the book agile conversations together was reading business books that all talk about how important communication is. We, we read the one famous one out there. there there's uh, uh, John with the, the book. Thank you. Um, visual aid. The, um, uh, the, the thing that's so frustration when you read, say, um, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, is it spends pages and pages and pages telling you about what happens when you have poor communication and, and lack of trust and everything else. It tells you how to diagnose it. It's like if you, if you got a, a medical book and it told you, you know, if you, if you lose your sense of taste and smell and you have a, uh, a headache and you feel this way, then you probably have COVID. But it doesn't tell you go get vaccinated or you know, go take this medicine or do something. It doesn't tell you what to do about it. And, and, and um, all those books are just like that, as well as a lot of the early Agile um, uh, uh, and, and the later Agile uh, um, uh, advice just tells you, um, here's the disease. Don't, don't have this disease. And the wonderful thing that we found is there's concrete steps that start with things as simple as folding a piece of paper in half that can help you. Maybe Jeffrey wants to talk more about those. Well, I think I think that this idea of just, um, beginning to learn what we're actually bringing to the conversation, because I think this goes to one of the challenges here is that uh, we keep we'll stress that this these are the things that happen whenever you have humans involved, because it's going to come down to the cognitive biases that people have, that that leads them to to uh, act in certain ways. And I think the example, what I was thinking of when Clayton described the, you know, agile as a process, is a great example, because it's people want uh, to have a sense of security and safety, and the idea that, um, you know, let's just go adopt this practice. We're just going to go pick that up, and we're going to follow these steps. These are the, you know, now agile is the best practice, and I can go apply this cookbook, and now we'll be better. And, and we'll get certified. So good. That's... It'll be great. <laughs> Wouldn't would it be super if we could just get certified, then we'll know that we're doing it the right way. We, exactly. And that's the point of certification. It's, it's to remove that fear and that risk. Um, and, it, and it is actually that uh, fear and risk is where this, um, not only this sort of behavior of grasping at uh, a plan or a process, a, a cookbook, but it's also where the problems in our conversations come from. That we, it's, we, we there's one way we know is the right way to behave, um, but then there's how we actually behave in practice when there's any potential for a threat or embarrassment, which basically means anytime you want to open your mouth, <laughs> there's a, a potential for that. So it, it comes in quite quickly, but we're unaware that it's happening. So that's that, uh, that there's, um, th those hidden elements that uh, trip us up. So, so how do we get there to ensure that we have safety and security and, and how do we get the trust that where we can have those conversations where it's not just, I'm going to have a conversation with you where I tell you th something and you do it. Uh, it is more, 
Yeah, that would not be a high trust conversation. That, right. that would be a low trust conversation. And and it may be very effective. There are certainly circumstances where, where that would be useful. But most circumstances, um, you, you would like to have much greater trust, but people don't know how to get there. So um, I'll, I'll describe briefly um, the kinds of things that they're in the book extensively. And there's some material on conversationaltransformation.com where you can get free videos and uh, blog articles and all kinds of stuff about how to do this. It's, it's, it's not trivial, um, but it's trivial to describe because what you do is you take a piece of paper and a pen. It, it, it helps if you have a, a couple of colors of pen, but you can do it with one. Um, you fold the paper in half and then unfold it and you wind up with two columns. And on one side of the column, the, the, the paper, you write what you uh, actually said and what you thought. And Jeffrey has some uh, an example of it. So what people actually said in the conversation, the actual words that came out. Now, you might not know. You might even have a Slack conversation so you can go look at it. Um, but in many cases, you'll just be remembering. And that's fine. The, your brain will just do the same thing as it did in the conversation. It'll make the same mistakes. So you'll, you'll have the same material to analyze. <laughs> um, and then on the left-hand side, you write down what you were thinking and feeling during the conversation. Um, if you happen to be telepathic, you can write what the other person was thinking and feeling, but otherwise you can't. You can only if they're telepathic, though, they knew you were going to say that, so it's fine. Yeah, exactly. So you, you really don't need to listen to the rest of the podcast. Just get in touch with us. We have some stock market investments. <laughs> today. But um, uh, assuming you're not telepathic, you write the uh, what you were thinking and feeling on the left-hand side. And then you do a couple simple steps, and we can go as much into depth on this as you want. I don't know how much uh, detail you want us to go into, but um, you look for things like question marks which are indicators of um, curiosity. Can't be curious if you don't ask any questions. And uh, you look for things that you thought but didn't say. And that's a signal for transparency. If there's something that you thought, like, uh, gosh, that Ash guy, he just isn't really listening. He's, he's concentrating on something else. He's looking up into true. space. I'm picking on you, Ash, because you happen to be on my screen. <laughs> uh, sorry, but uh, and you're not doing that at all. But if I were to think that but not say it, then that would not be transparent. But if I were to say, Ash, it looks like you might be a bit distracted. Is there something else going on? That would be an example of being transparent and then curious. I'd be finding out from Ash that, in fact, he might be looking at the clock to see if he could extend the podcast time because it's so enthralling, right? Then I would be learning something new as part of the conversation. And if this sounds weird, if this sounds like an odd thing to do, you're getting the experience I was describing at the beginning of, of listening to Benjamin and thinking, this comes from Mars. What where, where was this guy talking about? You know, did he just land from an alien ship? It will sound very strange and unusual. The, the benefit is that if you take, just as if you take your code as an object of, of study, and if you say, I'm going to test this code, and I'm going to have code reviews, and I'm going to, to investigate how to make it better, that's how we got better at writing code. You know, when mm -hmm. the original coding that people did on punch cards in the 50s, they didn't have code reviews and this kind of stuff. <laughs> Maybe they did, and I don't know about it. I'm not that old. But um, it, it, we, we learned how to do these things better by looking at coding as not just a thing you did on punch cards, but as a, a, a mental activity that but it's of value in its own right. And um, that's what we're advocating that people do with their conversations. And when you look at them as first class elements of your culture, you suddenly find there are all kinds of things that you could do differently, not the other person, but you could do differently that would improve that conversation and um, uh, massively increase trust. And in fact, the, the value that you're getting from the cultural change that you're trying to implement. And I'll just say here, because one of the key elements is, is this element that you need to practice it because what we're describing here is not a belief system. Mm -hmm. A lot of people believe they should have trust. A lot of people, you know, everyone would espouse, oh, yes, we should have trust. In fact, I should be curious. I should share my thoughts. I should care about other people's thoughts. Diversity is strength. The more ideas we get in here, the better decision we're going to make. Everyone believes that. So this is not about learning something to believe. In fact, because it's the things you already believe. It's things that you don't do because this is about skills. Do you have the skills to control your conversation in the face of interpersonal threat, meaning, you know, I'm in this group of people and I'm worried about what they might think. Um, you know, I don't want to upset, uh, uh, I'm going to go with, with, with John, why not? You know, I'm gonna, I don't want to upset John uh, by, by bringing this up. Uh, you know, he seems really attached to his idea. I think he's missing something, but I, you know, I, I don't want to cause a fight and, you know, it's almost lunchtime. So we let these things go. And uh, it's, it's this gap between what we believe and what we do is where the problems come. And I think this becomes a big obstacle 
to people actually practicing the skills. So that I find when people who've read the book, I hear one of two things from them. Uh, one group says, oh, I really love the book. There's so many interesting ideas in there. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I say, interesting, have you folded the paper yet and done a conversation analysis? They're, oh, no, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> the, the other group of people said, wow, I really like your book, but it's also a really slow read. <laughs> it's, it's taking me, I have to, I'm doing these exercises and I'm writing stuff out and it's really uncomfortable and it, and it takes a lot of effort. Uh, and I'm like, oh, great. And, and of the two, it's, those are the people who are getting uh, the mm -hmm. benefit. So this idea of it being a, a skill that you need to develop. But I like the analogy uh, that uh, Squirrel used to, to code. And, uh, and we talked about Agile, the, the technical skills of Agile, like test-driven development. It's the kind of things people say, like, oh, yeah, you know, we should, we should pair and we should do TDD. And, you know, we, we should be testing frequently and checking in small batches. But that's just an, a theory until you actually put it into practice, until you actually need to develop those skills to do it. And then suddenly, wow, it's actually, it sounded really good, but I'm doing it and it's really hard. <laughs> Maybe it's not such a good idea after all. No, 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 stick with it. <laughs> so I have, and that's exactly what we'd recommend people do. So I, I have uh, an innate ability, uh, let's call it, to, uh, to be unintentionally blunt in conversations, uh, which John can tell you. Uh, leads to some frustration uh, for me at work because then people won't listen to me because I've told them something they didn't want to hear or the, in a way they didn't want to hear it. Um, is, is fixing that um, a matter of practice? Are there, are there tips uh, maybe in, in the book that would, that would help with that? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So yeah, okay. I would Do say, you want I would, to take that Jeffrey? Yeah, I said, let's start with, with, um, this idea of recording your conversations. And then each chapter in the book has particular tools. And the one that comes immediately to mind for me is uh, in chapter three, the trust conversation. And we bring in uh, a, a tool to help use in your conversation analysis of which is called the ladder of inference. And the idea but, but here- my favorite name for it is, is test-driven development for people. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's exactly, and 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 uh, and, and that's uh, and uh, this idea of the ladder of inference for TDD for people. It, the reason it came to mind for me, Clayton, is because it sounds like if you're saying I'm blunt, well, that seems you're you're doing well on the transparency. The the, the what I would say is, how about the other side as far as curiosity? Have you uh, tested your understanding uh, of wh what they believe and why they believe it? And also, when you share it, are you sharing your reasoning? Uh, or just the conclusion. So mm -hmm. an example, in, in, when you say you're blunt, it could be anything from, well, that's dumb. You know, and that, that could be it. Like, well, okay, blunt, <laughs> transparent of, of something, but not very helpful, not very informative. And if you say like, uh, you know, I think, that's, I think that's dumb because, you know, the way I understand it is that this is gonna happen and this and this, and by the way, did I miss anything in, in my understanding of the situation? And someone might say, yeah, actually, Clayton, you missed this other thing that, that's going to prevent that. Or, you know, you, oh, okay. So, because the goal we're after here Something is- Something that's even dumber that, that you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> and and right. you would discover that you could be blunt about that and it'd be more effective. That's right. Exactly. Because the, the goal that we're after, and we would say in these conversations, or we would describe as mutual learning conversations, uh, which is, it's not necessarily that we're going to agree in a conversation. Mm -hmm. It's not reasonable that any two people, let alone five people like we have here, that if we put out uh, you know, shared facts, if all of us shared what we knew, all of us shared our own views, and we then said, right, now, given all the facts and, and beliefs, what do you think is the right thing to do? There's no reason that people should agree because they're different. They have, that's part of the, mm -hmm. the wonders of people that they have different experiences and different values and different judgment. They would make different trade-offs. And, uh, and so we can't, we can't really aim for uh, agreement as something as a reproducible thing we can aim for. But what we can uh, aim for is mutual understanding. Do I understand not just what you believe, but why you believe it, how you got there? Do you understand what I believe and how I got there? And then even if we don't agree, we, we at least have uh, gotten that sort of mutual understanding. And very often people uh, that, that just that act uh, builds trust and respect uh, among people. Even if you end up still disagreeing, you now have a, a much more principled uh, a relationship and, and, and disagreement, and, and people are okay with that. So that's the, that's the idea that came to mind for me. How does that sound to you, Clayton? Uh, definitely something to, to, to try out and look into. Um, sometimes my, my bluntness actually comes in the form of a question, like, why'd you do it that way? 
well, that would be a great example of given that because that I happen to be able to see you. Some listeners may not be able to see you. I I, I saw you kind of roll your eyes and look askance, and um, I'm I'm guessing I don't know this because I'm not telepathic. Um, I'm guessing that that might not be a genuine question, and a genuine question is one that would uh, that could result in you changing your mind. So uh, lawyers are great at asking non-genuine questions. They say things like, "Weren't you at the scene of the crime?" and weren't you uh, sitting in the car right outside the bank and weren't you uh, revving the motor? And and they want to pr uh, produce a particular narrative. When you say, uh, why did you do that? I have the feeling, the way you said it, that you might have a narrative in mind, like because you're an idiot or because you don't <laughs> understand these obvious things. And um, your laughter suggests that I might be right about that. Yeah, it's a like you're in my head. Question. A <laughs> yeah. genuine, here's, a, here's a genuine question. And Clayton, this is a, you're being a perfect foil for this. You're being a perfect example. And I really appreciate you being this example for us because listeners may be thinking, how, how could I change this? That's, that seems obvious. I mean, I do want to ask, why the heck did you do this stupid thing? Um, and, and you want to know that. The thing that you shift is not your curiosity, not not the, the level of curiosity that you have, but its subject. And so you start with the bottom of what we what the the, the, the theory is the, the ladder of inference. But you could think of it as your first test, like in test driven development. And you ask about something that you can see or hear. So you might say, So I think that what you did is that you used uh, Kubernetes. Uh, to deploy a COBOL application. Is, is that what you did? Did I, did I really understand that that's what happened? And the person says, no, you were wrong. <laughs> we thought about doing that, but we did this other thing. And suddenly you get a red test and that changes your, reason, your reasoning. And then you say, ah, oh, okay. So you use Docker to deploy a COBOL application. All right, now I understand the first step. And the important thing for me there is that you were deploying COBOL. Does that seem important to you? Because that seems really unusual and different to me. And they say, yeah, it sure was strange. I don't know why we were using it. Um, it was Jeffrey's idea. And then you say, ah, now I've learned something new. The person I'm talking to isn't the guy who thought up deploying the COBOL application using Docker. It's Jeffrey's fault. So you might stop the conversation and then go have the conversation about why the heck did you do that with Jeffrey. And so I've just given you two examples of getting a red test as you move along slowly the way you feel like when you're doing test-driven development through your conversation, instead of racing to the end, saying, why the heck did you do this? Boy, that was stupid. You start at the beginning, share your reasoning, and very often you find out something else that is useful to you. Notice in neither case did I agree that deploying COBOL via Docker was a good idea. Right? right. I, didn't, I didn't suddenly change my mind and agree with the other person. But what I did is I learned new facts about the imaginary situation that seems pretty dumb, and um, it helped me understand, in fact, the depths of dumbness and um, who's, who was uh, the, the person I needed to talk to about it. Yeah, so need... that's just a tiny example of how you could change your conversation and get a, a different result. Yeah, when you, when you said TDD for people, uh, I, it, instantly in my head, I thought red, green, refactor. Well, I'm, I'm, I get red real easy because that's the color of their face. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. But what you could do is you could get red in terms of what I was doing, where you right. could learn new things. Yeah, in terms, in terms of my understanding. mindset shift yeah. for you. Exactly. And then you could change it and you could actually get green. In fact, the other person might say, yeah, boy, you know, we all told Jeffrey that was a stupid idea, but he didn't listen to us. And then you build trust with that person because you have a shared story and you can say, boy, what, let's both be curious and let's go find out from Jeffrey why he wanted us to do that. He might learn some really good reason for it. And th that's the sort of shift that happens. But it, you can see how much hard work it would be for Clayton. Clayton would need to change what he's doing. In no case did we change what other people were doing. We didn't change Jeffrey. We didn't change the person Clayton's talking to. We changed Clayton, and he got different results. I will, I will definitely be adding test-driven discussion to the list of things to explore. <laughs> Excellent. Chapter three. You'll enjoy it. There are videos on our website. Yeah, you know, I really appreciate how the chapters are laid out in the book. It seems they're, you're building... Uh, narrative, you're building more discussion, you're building uh, new and different skills, starting with improving conversations, uh, trust, fear, why, uh, getting up to commitment and accountability. Those those two words in particular seem like they could potentially be trigger words for for people because it, it it's you know I don't I don't want to make a commitment I, I don't want to be accountable if if something <laughs> goes awry. Well, there's a reason that's in that order because the, that often those are trigger words and dangerous words if you don't have trust if you ha have not reduced fear and if you don't understand why you're making the commitment in the first place. So once you've um, laid those foundations, 
then actually those are those are your friends because um, you you understand what you're trying to accomplish. You've aligned with the other person. You no longer think that um, deploying COBOL using Docker is a dumb idea because you've understood the reason. There is some really good reason in this very strange special case why it's a good idea. And now you're ready to think about committing to improving that and maybe moving to a, a, a much more modern stack. And the other person is ready also. So once you have the uh, the foundations, things get uh, much easier. But absolutely, I wouldn't start there. That's why we said start with the trust, start with uh, those elements. But we give um, the same kinds of concrete techniques involving folding pieces of paper and um, uh, doing s slow tests and so on, the same kinds of methods apply to commitment and accountability once you have the foundations in place. And one of the things is, is it also it's, it's bilateral. And, it, and even just thinking about this, I know my interpretation of the word accountability changed when I heard Ken Beck speaking at, I think it was Java 1 in something like 2004, 2005. And he was giving a, 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 a talk about his own career. And he brought up the word accountability and how it had changed. And it's not that he's, he, and he changed my view of it because it's not about, you know, holding someone to account and, or the fear that someone's going to mm -hmm. hold me to account. Oh, who can we hold accountable for this success? You know, not something you hear very often. It's usually, you know, this went wrong. Who do we hold accountable? But he, he said, no, no, it's it, the properly envisioned. It's like, if I'm accountable, it means I'm obligated to render account. I should, I should feel compelled like professionally as uh, to be responsible for what I've done and, and share my, my thoughts and, and what I did and, and why I did it. And that really changed my view. And as a result, when I, when I was at uh, Tim and we adopted sort of a, a skills model of things we wanted to uh, uh, rate people on as strength areas for people to develop, we had a pairing and, and one was judgment and accountability. So it's both your ability to have good judgment and also to account for that judgment. And in part of that, and this is the bilateral part, is the person that you're accounting to probably has some responsibility for what they're uh, uh, telling you. You know, so if someone uh, says, you know, Jeff, can you do this? I, I need to know some more information, not just what they want done, but I need to know things like the constraints involved. We lay out this this in, in the accountability chapter. If we talk about the, the value of a briefing and back briefing, yeah. so the person who's who wants accountability from me is obligated to uh, render a briefing to me that gives me the information I need such that I can uh, actually be accountable uh, in a responsible fashion. So it's a, it's a partnership. And, and that idea is, it was, was really um, powerful and helpful for me in, in both directions, both as someone uh, asking for an account and also someone who's rendering an account. Um, so what, one of the things I kind of want to roll a little bit back uh, to like the trust and fear conversations. Um, Cause I, I see two, two sides of, of, of things and maybe you guys can address, address them. But there's the first side where I see people who are, again, this is probably more to that visibility or the transparency uh, question, but they're too afraid of what might happen to them to be transparent with what, with their actions maybe they're afraid of being held accountable down the line or you know and they, again to using the afraid accountability of being fired, in the, like right? you have yeah 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 the, who who do we send to the guillotine sort of accountability exactly. yeah. right um uh, but then on the flip side i would say uh what about the situation where <laughs> We we talked about sort of or maybe in the the op the the person of uh, Clayton Clayton's uh, you know uh, blunt conversation right <laughs> or you're the person who is being handed instructions but it's a one way street that these instructions are coming down and so you feel like you're not being trusted uh, but maybe you're almost willing to be tr trust trusting the conversation back but how maybe you don't feel empowered to to have control over that conversation or are there other techniques or tips that um you can bring that other person into that um into develop sort of bringing that conversation level improving that conversation quality uh without them having to like have read the book and know everything and you know uh kind of uh, fall fall down that side path that's fantastic good, good, good news they, they, do, they don't have to have read the book for, for you oh. to get effective results yeah and, and that's and that's one of the first questions we get asked from people is, um, you, you know, we get asked one or two ways. And the first way is, does, does the other person need to be doing this also? But the way I like even more is, if I'm practicing this and the other person isn't, isn't does that mean I lose by default? 
<laughs> if, 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 I, if, I, if I'm being transparent and curious and they're, and, and they're being normal, do I, do I lose? And, and the, the good answer is no. There's nothing about being transparent and curious means that you lose. And I like this example where you're saying, um, you know, how, how can I change the dynamic with this other person even if they haven't read the book, they don't know these theories, you know, how could that happen? The good news is you, you just, by you behaving differently, they will act differently. Mm -hmm. And it's, and this is, it's, it's simple that, you know, people respond differently when their environment changes and to mm -hmm. that other person, you're just environment. Mm -hmm. that, that's really hard for people to conceptualize because, you know, we're all like first person heroes of our own movie. <laughs> you know, I, I'm the camera, of this movie goes everywhere that I go. I am never off screen. And it's really hard to imagine that to the other person, you're not equally important. <laughs> you know, so, you're, a, you're an extra, sorry to fill you in. <laughs> yeah, you're, 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 you're just stimulus. And so when you behave differently uh, and you provide different stimulus, their response will be different. Hmm. And so that's the sort of um, humble way of saying, yeah, at, at a baseline, if you if you're different, they'll be different. However, there is that challenge of well, how do I get to be different? And one thing is, mm -hmm. you know, it's funny we went to this idea of like, oh, people might, you know, I might be fired. I happen to be just today reading Amy Edmondson's book, um, The Fearless Organization. And Amy Edmondson mm -hmm. is the person who coined the term psychological safety. Um, at, at least her work brought it to um, public prominence, and she describes it as this um, a, a group attribute. It's not about trust between individuals. It's a group attribute, and it's about interpersonal threat. How do I feel about speaking up? And in it's, it's in not a long-term thing. It's the immediate, like right now, how will I be judged uh, by the person in the moment? If I, if I say this, will I be seen as I'm, if I'm, uh, as I'm stalling? You know, if they're demanding and I ask for clarification, will they look at me as an obstacle? Mm -hmm. Might they lose trust? And it's these, it's these small micro decisions that we make all the time. And, and typically, humans have a strong bias towards being safe mm -hmm. rather than effective. It, we, you know, it's, um, we are social primates. As social primates, uh, our status is the number one determinant of reproductive success. And so anything that would cause us to lose status uh, through embarrassment is, is worse than death. Mm -hmm. And that sounds extreme, but actually the, the studies would show that people would rather risk dying in a fire than being embarrassed. And this, and this, there's a particular study that talks about this. And, and so it looks like, like this. If you came into a doctor's office for you're going to take a survey and you're waiting in the waiting room and smoke starts coming out of the ventilation, what would you do? Now, whatever you're thinking, the real answer depends on how many other people are in the room. Because if you're alone, 100% of the people have a thought process that says like this, smoke might be a fire, don't want to die. And 100% of people get up and says, hey, there's smoke. I'm worried about this. But they if get help just, or they pull the fire alarm or something. Something. But if there's just two other people, so three people in the room, two people you've never seen before, will never see again. They can't fire you. You don't work for them. <laughs> then 66% of the people will sit there and do nothing while smoke fills the room. Enough that they start coughing and opening windows and, and not being able to breathe. And, 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 and it's because apparently the thought process is smoke could be a fire, don't want to die, but if I'm wrong, I might be embarrassed, I guess I'll sit here. Because everybody else seems to be, no one else is doing anything, so it's probably okay. And, uh, and there's so much caught up in this one experiment that relates to our communication, which is, for example, that we, you know, about how we perceive risk and how poorly we perceive risk in the moment and, and, and how little we pause to reflect on what the real, what's really at risk. And, and also including our ability to read other people and the mm -hmm. belief that they can read us. Because when, we, when you ask people who are in this experiment and you say, well, what was going on in your mind? They're like, I was terrified, but I looked around and the other people were calm. They thought everything was fine. But these are, <laughs> they're saying about each other, they're like, no. So they had the illusion that they could read the other person accurately, which was wrong. Mm -hmm. And the other person mm -hmm. could read them accurately, which was wrong. And, and all of this goes into our communications. It's no surprise 
for, for us, when we go in and we talk with teams who uh, feel like they'd like to have better performance, that the number one cause of why they have communication problems is not unproductive conflict. It's not that they're arguing all the time. And that that's happened some places, but it's much more rare. Much more common is a bunch of people who are worried they're, they're too nice to each other and they're not they're not saying what they think they're not saying what they believe and because they're worried about how they'll be perceived psychological safety is essentially the belief that even if i make a mistake whatever i say people are going to interpret generously they're going to believe that I, what i was saying what my motivations were good and it was intended for the the good of the mission the good of the group and i, and I will be uh, judged by that criteria and when people believe that they're much more likely to speak up. And so I will say this, in the, in the absence of a group that's already established that, you can begin establishing it by being a person who behaves that way, who begins to say, look, I, I'm gonna go ahead and build the skills so that even when people aren't making it easy, I can start being transparent, I can start being curious. Well, and by me being curious, for example, then the other people will respond with transparency. If, I, if people aren't sharing their thoughts because they haven't been asked, <laughs> if I ask them, hey, what, what were you thinking here? They're, they'll tell me. So that's, that's what happens in practice. Awesome. What uh, resources might you direct our listeners to, to who, who might be looking to sort of improve their conversation skills? Well, wait, wait, there's this book that somebody wrote called Agile <laughs> Conversations. That's that's a good place to start. Um, but there, there's there's a whole panoply of other things related to it. So um, you could look for uh, books by a guy named Chris Argyris, who, who was the kind of original social scientist who um, brought up a lot of this. There's his followers um, who, who wrote books like uh, Difficult Conversations, The Elephant in the Room. Uh, Jeffrey is much better on these than I am, so he can add to the list. Um, and there's uh, lists of these and uh, videos and other material that uh, reinforces enforces these ideas, for instance, material on uh, that Clayton could could watch or read on uh, uh, the, the <laughs> building trust through the test driven development for people. So I, I'm, it's my mission now. I'm going to try to get Clayton to, uh, to, to try some of this stuff. Um, but uh, if listeners want to go there, uh, that, that would all be on conversationaltransformation.com, uh, or you could go to agileconversations.com. It all winds up at the same place. Um, there's our podcast, for example, Troubleshooting Agile. We have 150 episodes. You don't have to listen to all of them. You you can, you can start with the recent ones um, and uh, lots of material on uh, how to apply all of these techniques, uh, both paid workshops and um, free material. And I'm doing a live stream next week and all kinds of other fun things. So uh, you can uh, interact with us and with people who have the same ideas in lots of different ways. And um, saving the best for last, Jeffrey does uh, free conversational dojos, uh, uh, which you can come to and actually practice these things. So I'm, I'm expecting to see Clayton there. <laughs> and I'll say this, I just want to that last point because if people often want the resources but um, because it's more comfortable to to read and think about the these thoughts but what really is needed to get better is to to do the practice mm -hmm. to do the work mm -hmm. so if anyone who wants to improve i would say start with one of the free conversational dojos um, you can show with no experience and you know a piece of paper and a pen and get started and um, start learning uh, immediately all right uh, sorry, uh, our stream has been skipping, and so I've been <laughs> try, trying to figure out how to prioritize my computer and the router. Um, uh, what has been helpful in your careers uh, that you might share with those just getting started or those looking to level up their own career? I'd say for me, it's been very clear that, that has been a, a focus on trying to be better. And uh, that may may seem... Uh, straightforward, but what, what that means is um, trying not necessarily uh, I'm not optimizing for comfort, not yeah. not to continue doing what I have done in the past, and instead to be saying, you know, is there a better way to do this? And that's been been true throughout my whole career. Whether it's uh, uh, better tools, uh, better techniques, uh, better process, you know, wherever I always say wherever we are now at this moment, start with our current condition, and then say, you know, what's the, what are our current obstacles and how can we start improving you know, right now. And, and that the idea of little marginal improvements um, add up over time. And that, that to me has made a, a huge difference over the course of my career that con constantly pushing and being open to, to things that are new and uncomfortable uh, and grounding it in what I'm currently doing. 
And so as opposed to trying to fly off to say, oh, things must be better somewhere else. Uh, things, you know, if only we were in a different organization, then we could do all this cool stuff and that would be great and wonderful. But, but to me, the, the skill has always been, how do we take the, the current problems that we have and, and solve them in better ways? And I'll just build on that by saying that the way I've um, applied that and the way I've used it, and I've seen Jeffrey use it as well, is, is definitely to um, look to interactions with other humans as a very good way to learn what those um, improvements could be. So to come back to the original story we, uh, I was telling at the beginning, uh, you know, I had this bizarre set of tweets coming in, and I thought, what on earth is this? It would have been easy for me to just say, well, there's some, some strange people out there. You know, welcome to Twitter and move on and do something else. I said, I'm going to find out what those people are talking about. What what is this guy got? And it turned out to be hugely valuable and lead to a completely different career for me and, and uh, with huge amounts of growth and value. So uh, if listeners are thinking to themselves, boy, well, there's some nuts on, on the podcast that today. That they think <laughs> that you can change your culture by just talking differently and folding pieces of paper in half. I'd encourage you to go and try it. Go and find out more about it. Um, and uh, the most important thing, even if you don't do any of that, if somebody comes along and says, well, there's nothing we can do about the culture, we can't improve our organization. Uh, it's, it's just how uh, organizations are. There's nothing that's better. At least tell them there's some people who are crazy enough to think there is something you can do, even if you're not going to take it on. Please tell them, because uh, uh, too often people just accept whatever they have. Mm -hmm. And I'd sure like people to be more dissatisfied and more frustrated um, and frustrated enough to go and try something crazy like folding paper in half using uh, test-driven development to improve their conversations. Very cool. Um, where can our listeners go to follow you and sort of keep up with what you're working on? Best place is tra conversationaltransformation.com. I'm sure you guys will throw it in show notes and other places like that. Um, if you can't remember that, just search for Agile Conversations. If you can't remember that, maybe you'll remember my name, douglassquirrel.com is another good place to go. <laughs> and Jeffrey has jeffreyfrederick.com. So um, then any of those, you know, if you're driving, don't, uh, you know, try to write it down <laughs> while you're driving. Please, you know, stop and, you know, write this down later. But uh, if you Google for for any of those, you'll, you'll find us very quickly and, and lots of material and, and free stuff and uh, paid workshops and other good things. And of course, of course, that will include links to us on on Twitter and LinkedIn. So we're we're on on those. Absolutely, socials. no, of course, we are. And we like people to challenge us. So if you think we're idiots and we've got this completely wrong and it would never work for you, that that's the perfect thing to do is is uh, get in touch with us and tell us why we're wrong. We we like to learn, and and we might just have some ideas for you. And we we might end up responding to it, uh, taking on your challenge on onto our podcast and and answering, exactly. <laughs> discussing the, we, we uh, just discussing did that. the controversy. Yeah just did that today so we had somebody disagree with us and it was a very fruitful conversation so please disagree with us all right great stuff guys really appreciate it uh chat hang on for just a minute we've got a hard stop at the top of the hour but uh, we'll spend a minute or two addressing any additional questions and we'll wrap up the podcast from here so with that jeffrey douglas really appreciate you coming on the podcast today uh, thanks for having us thank you that was jeffrey frederick and douglas Gorrell. Jeffrey is an internationally recognized expert in software development and has over 25 years experience. Douglas has been coding for 40 years and has led software teams for 20 of them. If you like this episode, please like, rate, and review on iTunes. Find show notes, blog posts, and more at sixfiguredev.com. And catch us live each week on Twitch, and be sure to follow us on Twitter at sixfiguredev. This has been another episode of the Six Figure Developer Podcast, helping others reach their potential. I am John Calloway. I'm Clayton Hunt. And I am John Ash. Oh. And and Clayton has actually come a long way in, in the last <laughs> several years. And we, we applaud him for that. Um, yeah, we did have a, a couple of comments, at least. Wes uh, said, uh, sounds similar to nonviolent communication skills have been practiced uh, in a way to make more sense to developers. Um, I... I was given a copy of five dysfunctions of a team at an organization that apparently had been using it to assemble their teams because they had all of them. Um, but uh, so, but it, it was a good reading. They were using it as a guide. This is what yeah, you should do. Yeah, this is, this is how you do That's that. That's the problem with the book. Sorry, we get very frustrated with that book because mm -hmm. it is so annoying that it doesn't tell you what to do. You flip to the back of it. And, and it, I don't blame that company. If they used it, that they might wind up with the dysfunctions because it just tells you how to diagnose. You flip yeah. to the back and it says, um, uh, go on a ropes course and tell stories about your origins. And that's mm -hmm. what will build trust.
uh, 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 maybe it does. Good for them. But the, 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 my vigorous experience is you have to do a lot more practice to build trust. And all it does is tell you, here's what you, uh, here, here's why you have a problem. Yeah, so, I've sorry, also I can get on my soapbox for a long time on that one. But yeah, I've also been in, in I was just going to say nonviolent communication is one of our favorite uh, topics. So Jeffrey is uh, an expert in that area as well. Yeah. Yeah, and many organizations I've, I've been a part of have tried to start like a book club and, have, and inevitably the, the, the first suggestions are always, well, you know, design patterns or, or microservices or Kubernetes books, right? It's, it's never five dysfunctions of a team or team topologies or agile conversations. It's, it's never how do we break down the silos and learn how to communicate and be effective. It's how do we use technology? Like technology isn't the hard part. It, Be, it's because that's easy. safe, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's comfortable. If, mm -hmm. if we could just get certified in this, if we can just use the right tool, if we can just, you know, Docker will solve all our problems. And it's not that COBOL's of difficulty or that we don't understand what customers want or why we're we're building the software this way. It, it, it's much safer and simpler to to change the technology or to change the organization to to use the Spotify model because we think Spotify uses it. It's so much safer and easier, but the problem is it doesn't actually make the changes that you need. Yep. yep. And I uh, want to be respectful of your time. I know that Ash and I, I think have a hard stop, and I know you gentlemen are, uh, you, you fine British gentlemen are nearing the end of your day. Uh, and uh, so but with that, we'll, we'll say thank you. Look for the podcast out in two weeks from today. We'll get the audio all cleaned up. We'll hopefully address any of our video concerns on Twitch and, and get that fixed and, and backed up to YouTube appropriately. Uh, otherwise, look for us back this evening, 8 p.m. Eastern for live coding, and then next Monday afternoon, 6 p.m. Eastern for live broadcast of the podcast. And with that, we will raid our friend Lana Lux and see what she's working on and say thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Right. Thank you.